Hello everyone, and welcome to this, the final video for conservation paleobiology, in which we're just taking a slightly different direction, and we're going to be talking about something called geoheritage and geoconservation. So this is actually a different topic to conservation paleobiology, but I hope you'll see as we go along why it kind of fits with this idea of conserving um, the natural resources. So let's start, and let's start by defining what geoheritage actually is. So geoheritage um, is a relatively recent concept, and it is kind of a summary of all of the things that are important to us as people who study earth sciences. So I put a definition of this on the, uh, <clears throat> on the slide here, which says, Geoheritage encompasses global, national, statewide, and local features of geology at all scales. And then it goes on to list a series of different reasons why these sites may be important. So what we're really talking about is geological features that are important. This is what geoheritage is. Those may be igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. They may be stratigraphic. They could be um, something to do with structural geology, such as folds. They could be geochemical. They could be geomorphological. They, they could even be hydrological. But some of those are also paleontological, hence why it makes sense to me mentioning those here. So that's what geoheritage is. Geoconservation is the preservation of sites of geoheritage. So that may be for the purposes of heritage, for science, or education. So geoconservation is looking after these sites of geoheritage. This encompasses and is associated with geotourism. For example, if we want um, the Giant's Causeway, shown on the left, this famous columnar jointing, um, to be there for future generations, we have to work out how to look after it. And it's also related to other areas, such as human, uh, the human endeavor, the studying of these, um, of these sites. So the idea really behind uh, geoconservation is to encourage tourism to geoheritage sites, but also to protect those sites for future generations and to look after the historical sites that we have um, access to, especially here in the UK. There's an example on the right hand side here, which is um, Sicker Point, which was integral in the history of the understanding of geology. <coughs> No, excuse me, because James Hutton visited it when he was trying to work out what an unconformity was. Geoconservation applies on all scales. We can be talking about continents down to crystals. So really, there's this wide range of things that fall under this banner of geoconservation. I, you may be asking, well, why is this important? Why should I care? Well, as we've learned from our conservation paleobiology lectures, fossils can be vital to understanding life today, and they inform our practices in the conservation of living ecosystems. And this is true in a great many areas. Fossils help us to obtain scientific data that allow us to better understand our planet and the history of life. And as such, it is essential to guarantee access to geological materials, so fossils and minerals, rocks, soils and landforms, which have those special characteristics, so earth science as a subject can continue. These sites are also key to the education, to education about the natural wor world, so all of this is something that makes these sites worth preserving. So that's what geoheritage and geoconservation are, and I'm teaching you to you today as part of this evolution and paleobiology course um, with a vested interest in fossils, right? We're doing a course that has paleobiology in the title. So let's double down on fossils and let's think about this a bit more. So a key question we may face if we're thinking about geoheritage and especially fossils, because they were part of geoheritage, is what is a fossil? So that is actually a really, really good question. As paleontologists, we generally broadly agree that a fossil is a structure that represents evidence of ancient life. So this can be um, everything from jellyfish, as you see on the right hand side here, to big chunky uh, vertebrates like T-Rex, everything in between, and of course trace fossils. This is a definition that we as scientists 
are happy with. But let's unpack that a little, because actually, if we want to protect fossils, we're going to need a legal definition of what a fossil is. You can't protect something unless you can define it. So given the exceptional nature of the process of fossilization, a fossil is basically by definition a unique or at least rare and a non-renewable natural object. As such, it will be a highly valuable asset to whoever owns it. In contrast to the science definition that we've just highlighted, there is actually, at the moment, no definition of what a fossil is in English law. That's not true of the UK, note that I said English. Um, the framework, as we'll learn shortly, around the UK actually differs from uh, nation to nation. More specifically, there is no actual definition of what a fossil is in a legislation. So these are the laws that are created by the government or other bodies. As such, that means what a fossil is, is something that has been decided by case law. Um, so this is the legal precedent that's set by the rulings of judges in court. And in that context, um, one of the key um, uh, periods or key events that we need to understand the definition that we have is an early legal case that was that of the Eternal General, General versus Tomline in 1877. So this surrounds this handsome chap on the left hand side here called Colonel George Tomlin who was the Lord Manor of what is now the Port of Felixstowe, a woodcut from around this time of Felixstowe is shown on the right hand side here. So Colonel George was a, a land owner and the British War Department was a tenant on part of his land. They had constructed a circular fort on this land called a Martello Tower that was there to defend the coastline of Felixstowe. That land was underlain by Pliocene deposits containing coprolites, so fossilized poo, um, and at the time, those coprolites were a really important source of phosphate for the fertilizer industry. So Tomlin went ahead and he drank, he dug a trench to extract um, this, uh, these coprolites next to the fort. And the War Department was unhappy about this, so they sued him. After that court case, the judge ruled that as the owner of the land, Tomlin was entitled to those coprolites. He was the owner to um, the right to exploit that natural resource on his own land. But also the judge ruled that he uh, required the permission of the tenants on the land to build the earthworks to remove them. So the people who are living or on the land or using the land for whatever also have to be involved in this decision. So as uh, Colonel George hadn't done this, the War Department was awarded half the profits from the sales of his coprolites. And that's a precedent. This is something that now means that in uh, fossils, in English law, are if they are still in the ground, they are the property of whoever owns the mineral rights to that land. They cannot be collected without the permission of the landowner, but also of the tenant of that land. So all, all of that boils down to this case in 1877, and that's the legal status of fossil collecting in English law. And that actually affords them protection from everyone but the landowners. So that's quite useful to know. If we're worried about protecting our fossils, um, we, um, we want to uh, make sure they're protected. It's the landowners that we know um, have the final say on what happens to fossils on the land. Fossils that are no longer attached to the bedrock are a more complicated matter. In England and Wales, loose specimens are considered abandoned and therefore taking them is not stealing. In Scotland, all abandoned property reverts to the crown, so theoretically permission should be sought before removing any loose material. So as you can see, um, legal definitions of fossils and then fossil collecting actually become really quite complicated. Geoconservation measures are needed um, because many geological sites worldwide are under threat due to several anthropogenic factors. So these are, these are man um, uh, factors based on human activity. So when we're thinking about the risks to geological conservation is normally a people that we're worrying about. One of the key risk factors for fossils is smuggling 
and illegal collecting. Fossils, minerals and rocks are being stolen from many countries, feeding international smuggling networks that provide huge benefits to speculators. Um, a good example of why this happens is the dueling dinosaurs which were found in the Hell Creek formation of eastern Montana on the right hand side, or sorry, shown on the right hand side of this slide here. This is a, a 28 foot long ceratopsian and a 22 foot long theropod, basically two different kinds of uh, dinosaur preserved fighting. And it was sold last year, um, thankfully, it was uh, ultimately donated to a North Carolina museum. Um, for somewhere between seven and nine million dollars. This is a huge amount of money. And so it provides an incentive to break the law. There are other anthropogenic factors that we have to worry about in sites of geological interest, however. These include unsustainable mining. So the mining of mineral and energy resources is vital for human development in many parts of the world, in fact, all parts of the world, but it has to be carefully managed. Other sites are at risk through unethical scientific research. Some geosites are impacted by poor scientific sampling procedures. Also, unsustainable tourism and leisure, leisure activities um, can damage um, areas with fragile uh, geological features. For instance, caves, um, soft and unconsolidated substrates, rare fossils. All of that can negatively affect many geological sites. A, a very good example here is the Grand Canyon that's shown on the left, which has millions of visitors every year. And so if you want people to visit these sites of geoheritage, we have to be very careful about um, how we um, control that tourism. Other sites are at danger through urban development. Uh, there's been a rapid expansion of cities in recent years, and this will often occur towards rural areas due to population growth and migration, and that can destroy important geological sites. There is often, um, coupled with these risk factors, deficient statutory protection. So that means that actually the legal framework, which we'll be getting to shortly, is complex and often not very well designed. And so it's difficult to take legal action to protect geosites. Um, and I think it's safe to say that also we suffer somewhat um, in terms of cultural and scientific lack of understanding within those people that uh, make decisions and write policy society in general often has a relatively low awareness about and of the importance of geology and that makes our life harder as well. Finally, um, these risk factors can be exacerbated by inefficient administration. We find today that even when there are laws in place to protect sites, poorly trained public administration can leave geoheritage sites vulnerable. So these are the risks towards our geoheritage sites. So then a key question we face is, how do we manage paleontological heritage? So this is a, a key question. How will we protect and manage these important sites? In terms of a single fossil, there's a long and complex process from the discovery of a fossil uh, in the field to its incorporation into a collection and its use in an exhibition and dissemination. This involves finding the fossil, extracting it from the ground, preparing or conserving it, and then once it's in an institution, once we've done all of that work, we have to think about collections management. We have to think about the study and publication of that fossil so we can understand it. We can then think about exhibiting that fossil. And finally, about disseminating the word, telling people about this fossil. So that's a long and complex process for any given fossil. Uh, but we need to think about sites of paleontological interest too, those where there's more than, say, a single fossil. A paleontological site we could define as a particular location or a group of nearby occurrences in which fossils of any type and concentration are present. Not all fossil occurrences constitute paleontological heritage, just as not all the territory of country can be declared as geoheritage. So we have to have a framework by which we decide which sites and which fossils are sufficiently important to be considered paleontological heritage. And there are three different groups of criteria that we use to do this today. 
These could be scientific criteria. It could be based on the nature of the fossils. If you have fossils of exceptional importance, um, based on the geological age of the rock or the degree of preservation or type localities of famous, um, of famous uh, fossils, for example, those would all be scientific criteria. You can see two examples of those kind of sites on this slide here. On the left hand side, you can see the site um, of the Burgess Shale fossils. And on the right hand side, you can see the Solnhofen quarry where a lot of famous um, fossils, including Archaeopteryx, have been discovered. And both of those could be designated sites of paleontological heritage based on the scientific importance of the fossils in those sites. But there are other criteria we have to think about just beyond the scientific ones. So for example, there should, could be socio-cultural criteria. This could be a site of historic value, like Sicker Point that I showed you on a slide just now. These could be sites where the fossils may not be the best preserved, but they are of educational interest or they're of interest to tourists. They could be sites with a very famous or important geographic location, or they could be fragile sites, meaning that we want to look after them. So that's the second kind of criteria. And the third kind of criterion we may want to consider when we're designating sites to be of, of interest and importance is socioeconomic criteria. So this may be related to, for example, the economic value of the fossils, but these criteria have to be balanced with the urban value of a site. So sites in urban areas may potentially be available for development. We also need to balance the, uh, the need to, um, uh, to preserve, say, fossils in a site with the mineral values of those sites. That's in sites where there is also mineral exploration and sites where there are public works taking place. So all of these make for a fairly complex landscape when it comes to defining and looking after our sites of paleontological heritage. And as a ba on the basis of that, different countries have different legal frameworks which are informed by those criteria. I wanted to give you just one example of such a site today. So once we've decided um, that a site is important, how do we manage these sites? I can't tell you um, how this is done in every country in the world um, because it varies by region. So I'm just going to focus for you on the UK today and on one particular site. So the UK is actually fairly, um, has a well fairly well-developed framework for this kind of thing because the UK is considered the birthplace of uh, geology. Geology was born here and many geological features are either type examples that illustrate geological principles that are globally, globally relevant, such as the unconformities that Hutton studied, or their sites where geological principles were conceived and espoused for the first time. As such, this has led to geologists forming governmental and non-governmental organizations to achieve geoconservation goals. As a result, the UK is often considered the birthplace of geoheritage and geoconservation. And to a large extent, all of these efforts by these geologists have worked quite well. The result is an admittedly complex framework of legislation that covers areas where fossils can be found. There are actually quite a few different designations and management frameworks, as well as legal instruments that we use to govern and protect fossil rich outcrops here in the United Kingdom. And many of these are poorly publicized. Um, on the image that you can see here, these are the different acts that are shown in blue here that protect the Longmind in Shropshire, England. This is a heath moorland shown on the right hand side here. Um, it's, a, it's actually a, it's a moorland plateau that's owned by the National Trust. And the legal frameworks that support this, um, this uh, site of interest for us as paleontologists include the Country Right of Way Act. This effectively places sites of international and national importance outside the hands of ownership and into the realm of national heritage. So in this case, we could say that this actually belongs to the country as a whole. It's not in private ownership. The main designation that a locality such as this can be listed as for the purposes of geoconservation in England is that as a site of special scientific interest. 
Land with this status, often called SSSI status, is still owned by whoever owns the land before it was de designated an SSSI, but there are restrictions on what people can do there, especially in terms of building and development. So that's a slightly different way we can protect a piece of land compared to what we see uh, in Longmind here. So this Longmind, you can see is protected by everything in blue here, um, which is legislation and government. And the red blobs here are the governmental bodies that are um, responsible for enforcing these laws. And the green um, uh, boxes here show these special designations, which um, highlight uh, the different or define the different legal frameworks in which the long mint is looked after and our yellow box here is the National Trust which is a non-governmental organization as you can see from this flow diagram it actually really gets quite complicated so despite the fact that we have these in the UK fairly well developed geo conservation legal frameworks things do get really complex um, in terms of how we actually um, uh, look after them and how these laws are enforced so I think that's really interesting. If, we're, if we care about conserving our geological heritage, this is something that we should all uh, pay attention to. And I hope you found it interesting. That's it from me for this video, and I will see you um, in our next session in person. See you soon.